Now this evening I want to turn you to John's Gospel, chapter 1. Verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael. John 1, 45. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? I wonder if you understand why he said that. He understood his Old Testament, and according to the Old Testament, Messiah was to come out of Bethlehem. Nothing was said of Nazareth. So when Philip says, We found him of whom the Lord and the prophets spoke, Jesus of Nazareth, he answers, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip, very wisely, didn't argue with him, but simply said, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. That was a quick one, wasn't it? No one being convicted, converted, persuaded of Jesus so quickly as this man. So full of doubt when he came. And all Jesus had to say of him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And for reasons that we may see before the end of the evening, it was enough for him. And he fell on his knees, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Notice carefully what Jesus said to him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Thou shalt see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Do you understand? Can you guess what Jesus meant by those last words? Surely we remember that dream that Jacob had when he saw a ladder from set up on earth, the top of which reached to heaven, and the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And I believe Jesus was pointing Nathaniel and the others back to that old story and claiming that he and his cross were the spiritual counterpart of that ladder that Jacob saw in his dream. I think it would be good if we just turned to Genesis 28 and saw that old incident to which Jesus referred in the New Testament. Genesis chapter 28. And Jacob went out, verse 10, went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it unto thy seed. And thy seed, seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken.
spoken to the ox. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And many centuries after, Jesus said to the Nathaniel, You will see the heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so Jesus claimed that he himself and his cross were the spiritual counterpart of that ladder that Jacob saw in his dream, which linked earth to heaven. Some time ago, my wife and I were in Switzerland for some meetings, and in the home where we were staying, on our last morning there, the daughter of the home had to leave for work before we were up. And so she left a little uh, note attached to the door of our bedroom, a little note of thanks for our coming and a little note of good wishes to us as we went on our way. Our way. And this young woman was taught of the Lord and she included in her letter these words if your pillow be like a stone there is a ladder going up from it to heaven and the angels ascending and descending upon it if your pillow is like a stone there is a ladder and that ladder pictures Jesus to us. We have it of his own authority that we can take it in that way. And we can have that ladder even when we're having a hard time. Even when our pillow is like a stone. I want to consider first of all the man to whom this dream was given. Jacob. Then I want you to look with me at the dream itself. And then the man in the New Testament who was promised a realization of the dream in his experience, the family. It was a very unhappy young man who lay down to sleep in the open air that night. It was his first ever night away from home. He found himself in a strange country on a long journey. Darkness had overtaken him and he had to sleep in the open air gathering stones for his pillow and feeling very homesick. And what I believe added to his unhappiness was the consciousness that the situation in which he was in was his own fault. It was the cause he had wronged his brother and stolen by subtlety the birthright from the dying father Isaac that Esau was infuriated and vowed to kill his brother. And his mother told him there was nothing for it but to leave home and go to her relatives hundreds of miles away. And if Jacob was alone and homesick and disconsolate that night, he really has nobody to, ple to blame but himself. And I believe the stone on which he, made, which he made his pillow was symbolic of the fact that he was having a hard time. And I'm quite sure he would have felt, he felt, that this was the last place in the world where he was going to have a new experience of God. As he looked round, I think he said, if anything's a God-forsaken place, this is. And yet, that was the very place where God revealed himself to him. So that it so much so that he had to say, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. Now there may be some of us rather like Jacob. You may be, if the truth were known, in an unhappy state of heart because of the situation you're in. Yes, we often find ourselves in a difficult situation, in difficult circumstances. And that sometimes adds to our sorrow about it all is the fact that 
to some extent it's our own fault if we're in a jam we may well be to blame for it we've acted foolishly we've put people against us and here we are in this unhappy situation and deep down you know you have contributed to it and you may well feel that your pillow is like a stone and when we're in these situations you naturally feel that it's the last situation in which to expect a brand new experience of God and yet as in the case of Jacob it may well be the very place where you're going to have such a new experience so that you'll end by saying surely the Lord is in this place this place which I thought so God forsaken and I never knew it and so this is something of encouragement for some of us here and I very little bit very believe if it's true as the old hymn says our grace it is thy boast to come into our unlikeliest hearts we can also say our grace it is thy boast to come into unlikeliest situations even into yours and you can have a brand new experience of the Lord even as Jacob did indeed in Jacob's case it was his first up to then Jehovah had only been the God of Abraham of Isaac but at Bethel he became the God of Jacob so how did he have this revelation of God and it was a revelation of the God of grace that he had it was of course by means of this dream and in the dream as he lay there tossing somewhat uneasily on his pillow of stone he saw heaven open that was new one to him he thought obviously for a fellow like him heaven would be shut but it wasn't he saw heaven open but he thought it wasn't unattainable he saw there were steps leading from him right up to that open door I believe that the Hebrew can be better translated not a ladder but a staircase and he saw a marvellous staircase leading up from where he lay right up to heaven and more than that he noticed that going up on that staircase there were angels and then he looked again and he saw other angels coming down and there he was lying at the base of this staircase and above at the top of that staircase that ladder there was Jehovah himself speaking words of incredible good for Jacob and his seed and Jesus would have us see in that ladder a picture of himself it is one of the Old Testament foreshadowings of Jesus and I don't know any that teaches us more about the gospel about what Jesus has for us as Christians than this beautiful type of the Lord Jesus very often we understand things in the scriptures better by contrast than any other way and what a contrast this ladder is to the ladders which we have been trying to erect for ourselves you know man has a constitutional love of ladders if we want to get to know the Lord it's always by means of a ladder by that I mean there are certain steps to take certain heights to attain certain rules to keep and if you uh, are serious in climbing Jacob's ladder don't be, don't be uh, disheartened you're going to get there and you're going to get to know the Lord and it's very simple it's by means of a ladder and if having got to know the Lord we want to improve our relationship with God invariably we feel it by means of a ladder once again we frame certain steps we've got to take or rather we're told there are there are certain heights we've got to attain we must improve we must uh, do more we must be more devout and there are various rules to keep and if we seek to keep the rules and do what we're told we will vouch out improve our relationship with God and we'll have a deeper experience of him in our lives and if we fall into a pit of depression and sometimes we do or into a pit of guilt we feel so bad and guilty about ourselves 
We're quite sure the way out is by means of a ladder. Indeed, every psychiatrist, he, even if a psychiatrist has a different sort of ladder, there's always a ladder he suggests to you. And he counsels you. And he things to do and things not to do, things to tell yourself and not to tell yourself. And lo and behold, you'll soon be out of your pit, so he thinks, so he tells us. And then in Christian service today, how are we going to enlarge the coasts of the church? How are we going to bring souls to the Lord? And invariably, that which the church goes to is some sort of ladder, some sort of method. Today is the great day of methodology. The one thing that's necessary is simply knowing how to. And there's a great proliferation of how-to books. And everyone is simply putting towards us a ladder, which if we climb, if we ought to, it will lead us to the desired haven. And we shall see blessing and outreach in the church. And so I would say that man has a natural love of ladders. And that's the natural thing for us all to gravitate towards. These ladders are really variants of the way of work. We all know that by grace are we saved through faith, not a work. And we're happy to be saved that way. But when it comes to going on and getting further, and getting the victory and getting the fullness strange we forsake that way by which we began the way of grace and subtly if not quite clearly we resort to some form of work and we begin to fashion and direct our various ladders I want to say three things about these ladders which it is so natural for us to have recourse to and which very often we're taught is the way First of all, they do not start where we are. This good advice we're given, these things we ought to do, don't take account of the fact that we've been what we've been and done what we've done. They all assume that we are better than we really are and we're well capable. If only we make up our mind to doing this thing. But you know, we are really much lower than our counsellor thinks. He doesn't know the whole story of our past. And really, these ladders that others would propose to us, or which we propose to ourselves, do not reach us where we are. They all assume that we are better and more capable than we really are. And we are hardly able to reach the first rung, let alone the subsequent one. And then, secondly, the top of these ladders never really reaches to heaven and to victory. If you do manage to climb the ladder to a certain extent, your cons conscience tells you, but well, that's not enough. There's more you should do. There's higher heights that you must get to. And eventually, you feel you just can't win. Take one illustration, and I don't select this because it's any more important than the other thing. Take our devotion. There can be a ladder, and many other things can be too. But for the sake of our illustration, maybe you felt how lacking your personal daily devotions are. What do you say? Daily? Yes, daily. Oh, are Christians supposed to have a time every day? Yes. Oh, well, no wonder I've not been getting on very well. All right. I'll set aside a time every day for prayer. Fifteen minutes. And you adjust your schedule accordingly and lo and behold, there you are, having your little time. They're getting on quite nicely and finding it helpful. And then someone comes along who tells you, of course, he never spent less than half an hour Oh, half an hour. All right, let it be a half an hour, and you make it half an hour. And then to spoil it all, someone comes along and says, of course, the real successful Christians never spend less than an hour. An hour? And so you say, well, all right, let's make it an hour. And then to your horror you discover, you can't fill an hour. There's no prayer beyond a few minutes, and the Bible's dead. And to finish you off altogether, you pick up the book, about praying higher than you found there were a whole night when you didn't go to bed. And you say, oh, 
You just can't win. You know, these ladders, they all have something of that order. The, the top of them never reaches to heaven. They never really land you in victory. And if you get into a pit, and you seek to get out of the pit by means of a ladder, it's only to discover that you put the ladder against the wrong wall and you come out of the wrong side, <laughs> further away from God than you were before, more of a Pharisee and therefore further away than you were before. And these ladders, attractive as they might seem to be, and so reasonable, in the event never reach to heaven. And then they all involve climbing. After all, what's a ladder for? What's a staircase for? But for climbing. And what was it? What is that chorus the children sing? We are climbing Jacob's ladder and we think we must climb. And these proffered answers to our need all involve striving and struggling on our part. The problem is that though there's nothing wrong with the ladder, there's nothing wrong with the good advice. We are too weak so often to take it and to climb it. And yet the, the feeble attempt to do so only lands us in despair. Indeed, it, was, it would seem to me it were better not to have a ladder than having a ladder not having the strength to climb it more than a few steps. And it simply mocks. Now this is typical of all the various proffered variants of the way of work. It's the gospel we preach to our hearts. Every one of us is a preacher of the gospel here. You are preaching, I would say, almost every day to your own heart if to no other. And you know you don't always preach the right message. And very often you tell yourself the trouble with you is you haven't managed to climb those the, the steps of the ladder. You, you tell yourself that only good when you get higher up, all will be well. But the problem there is getting higher up. And thus, these ladders are all a disappointment to us. But how different was the ladder that Jacob saw? That ladder, that staircase, we're told, was set up on the earth. It began exactly where Jacob was lying. And Jesus and his cross begin just where you are. It's assumed that you have been the sort of Christian you have. If he assumes you've done what you know you've done and he tells you he's settled for the lot way out there on Calvary's cross when he said it is finished and this Jesus and his blood are available to you on street level and he is not shocked at what you have to tell him this really is the truth he is available to you as the true sinner you be as the one who's done those shameful things who's manifested the spirit you have. And you're not given something that begins up there where you've never been. But right down there, as deep as sin is, so is the cross of Jesus erected. And Jesus is available to us on street level. And then, I want you to notice that Jacob's ladder, the top of it, reached unto heaven. There was the staircase. And it didn't fall short of the objective, but it entered right up there within the veil. And this ladder, which is simply Jesus and his finished work, brings you right into heaven, right into victory. I remind you that Jesus was raised from the dead and went back right into the holy places not made with hands the top of that ladder reached unto heaven and listen he entered he was raised from the dead and went back into glory do you know how Hebrews tells us 
by his own blood. Did you know that? Jesus wasn't raised from the dead just because he was the Son of God. Jesus went back to glory. He didn't go back just because he was the Son of God, but Hebrews 13 tells us he was raised from the dead by the blood of the everlasting covenant. He'd taken our sins and our sorrows. He'd made them his very own. Therefore the penalty attaching to our sins, death, was his. And then he would have remained had there not been power, wonder-working power, in the blood of the Lamb. And it tells says in Hebrews 13, was raised again by the blood of the everlasting covenant. And then Hebrews 9 tells us, he entered into the holy place not made with hands, with his own blood. But for that blood he couldn't have gone back there. He's become an effigy of sin. He was made sin. But there shall in no wise enter into heaven anything that defileth. Not even the Son of God could have gone back there except for the fact there was power. Wonder-working power in the blood that he shed. That blood spake of the judgment of God for the sins he'd accepted on our behalf as being exhausted. And the everlasting gates lifted up their heads and the King of glory went in. How? With his own blood. And if that blood was enough for Jesus, it's certainly enough for me. He had on himself more sins than, 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 than any man's had. The most any man can have are his own sins. But Jesus had the world. And yet the blood was enough for him. And it's certainly enough for you and this matter. And that is not what your spiritual condition or lack of it. The covenant reaches into heaven and the way by which he entered you must enter to by the blood of the everlasting covenant and if only you're willing to get to him at street level immediately in him you're at heaven's level of course getting to him at street level is a matter of your willing because you don't get there without repenting but when you get there such is the power of the blood of Jesus you're in him at heaven's level and the top of it reaches unto heaven. I want to tell you, Jesus really does bring me through in a way that man's ladders never did. And then, with regard to Jacob's ladder, Jacob was surprised to find there was no climbing for him. He was very glad to see that not only was heaven open, but there was a staircase leading up there, just fine. He was about to take his coat off and start the steep ascent to heaven. When he noticed, there were angels ascending and there were other angels descending those angels ascending were bringing up his needs to God and those descending were bringing down God's mercy to him and he didn't have to do any climbing the angels did it it was all done there for him in that blessed heaven that sat it on the, uh, uh, on, uh, on the land uh, on the staircase on the ladder and I like to think that an angel going up met one coming down. And I like to think they had a little word or two together. And the one going up said, you know, that fellow down there, he's in a bad shape. You know, he's as homesick as I've ever seen anybody. He's so full of, full of unhappiness and self-pity and he's blaming himself like anything down there. It's all right, said the other angel coming down and said I've just I'm bringing down God's mercy and God's grace for a man in just that condition and he's discovered that this wonderful ladder was different than any other one he didn't have to do the climbing I want to remind you the big point when Jesus told the story was not the ladder in fact Jesus didn't actually mention the ladder the big point was the traffic on the ladder and you know it's interesting that famous thing Blessed assurance picks on this very thing. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. I tell you, the hymn writers seem to know their Bible better than we do, and they see the point. And this is a picture of this ladder, which is Jesus Himself. It's good to know there's a ladder, it's good to know there's a staircase. 
And just as you are bracing yourself for a new promise and a new attempt to be the better Christian and climb that steep ascent to heaven, you discover you don't need to do it. It's already been done for you in that very Jesus. For in Jesus, all our needs have already been brought up to God. And in Jesus, all grace has already been brought down to our level. There's nothing more that I can do since Jesus did it all. There's a new cause. I don't believe that this particular incident is really teaching us anything about angels. That I, I believe in angels. Billy Gray has written a book on angels. But I don't think this particular incident is meant to teach us anything about angels. It's meant to teach us about Jesus. And it needs all these aspects of the picture to give us an adequate picture, an adequate picture of him. What it simply means is it pleased the Father that in this Jesus all fullness should dwell. That in him the climbing up's already been done. The coming down's already happened. There's no need for us to ask to aspire to heaven or humble ourselves low or something like that. It's all done and all the fullness of the Godhead bodily is made available to us right where we are in our misery and need and defeat. And it no only needs the willingness to acknowledge that fact. And there I am, at the foot of the ladder. But coming to the foot of the ladder, in him I'm at heaven's level. And I want to tell you, that's happened in my experience again and again. I want to tell you, I haven't been able, and I haven't needed, to try and climb into the holiest of all by my own improvement. I've had to simply admit where I am, and come as a failure to Jesus on any new point he may show me. And when I come, such is the power of his blood, I'm true, into victory. And that without struggling and climbing. But you say, what about these things in our Christian life? Aren't we meant to do something? Don't we, ought we not to be witnessing? Ought we not to be spending times in prayer? Yes, of course we ought to. But not to get to, in order to get into the holiest of all but because through this ladder we got there I want to tell you you're going to, set, you're going to have a longer devotion so you just fine how are you going to manage having a half an hour prayer every day when your heart's cold when there's no song in your heart I want to tell you prayer will never take away sin I do not read in my bible that prayer bore my sins in its body on the tree even reading the bible will not take away sin this Bible wasn't crucified to me. It's me coming as I am. As a failure, as a needy, empty Christian again. Repenting of what God, what's gone wrong. And then, seeing Jesus has done it all. And the blood of Jesus brings me right through, into victory, with what was out. I want to pray. Oh, my only complaint is, not that I can't fill up the allotted time, but it isn't long enough. And the word. And then he says, a good time, but I've got to rush off to work. Or the children call. Or there are other duties. And it's delight. I want to tell you, these means of grace, grace are not the way to Jesus. But Jesus, found as that ladder, available to me where I am, is the way to these things. And thus it is, I find. I'm not committed to weary strugglings which never come off. Promises which he never fulfilled. But I continue coming to Jesus as I am and I find my chains fall off. My heart becomes free. I rise, go forth and follow him because he's already done it all. Because all fullness flows in him. I don't need to have to come to the cross and then think, well, I'd better go on to Pentecost. No, no, it's all multiplied to me there at the foot of the cross in that place of brokenness where I can test my name. What a wonderful picture this is. What a wonderful picture. So there is that, se that second part. And now a word or two about the last. We've looked at the man to whom the dream was given. We've looked at the dream itself. And then the man in the New Testament 
who was promised a realization of the dream in his experience. Nathaniel. Very wisely, Philip didn't try to argue with him and try and answer his intellectual doubts. He just said, come and see. And as Philip, as Nathaniel was coming to Jesus, Jesus said, behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile. And Nathaniel heard him saying this. And he said, whence knowest thou me? I don't think we've ever met. Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now that was deeply significant to Nathaniel. I can only imagine that that fig tree was a very special tree for Nathaniel. I can only imagine that it was that tree under which he used to sit when he wanted to think. When he wanted to perhaps try and pray. He wasn't much at praying, but there were times when he felt he needed God, though he didn't as yet know the Lord. There were times of his most innermost, when the most innermost experiences of his heart were expressed. That tree. And it would seem to be the previous day was a very special time for Nathaniel under his fig tree. I can only infer, and I'll tell you why when we cut in a moment, that on that occasion, there had been a taking off the mask off his face and off his heart with regard to God as never before. Because as a result of what happened under the fig tree, Jesus could say of him, an Israelite indeed in whom is no God. And I believe under that fig tree, he said, oh God, I have a failure. Oh God, I'm supposed to be a godly man in the synagogue, but I'm a I, I, I'm a failure. I'm a failure as a father. I'm not the head, spiritual head of our, my, our head. And in every other way, I'm a failure. And frankly, Lord, in spite of my religious upbringing, I don't know what, about spiritual, I don't really know you. And the Lord was content to let Nathaniel be honest about himself. And Jesus knew that. And that's why we he said, there is an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. He didn't say an Israelite indeed in whom is no sin. There was plenty of sin in Nathaniel, but there was no hiding of sin. Jesus knew that by what went on under the fig tree. And when Nathaniel heard that, he said, You saw me when I was under the fig tree, and you knew apparently what went on under the fig tree. There were only two people who ever did know it. One was me and the other was God. You must be God. And he's convinced of the Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then it was to that man that Jesus said, you're going to see more than that. You're going to see heaven. And this vision of the cross with the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now these are the ones who are given a vision of the cross, a vision of the ladder, a vision of the staircase, such as Nathaniel was promised. Those of us who perhaps are learning to be honest, who perhaps, I don't know whether there's a special Christian place, a special place where you pray, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. But perhaps some of us are beginning to take the witness box against ourselves before God. And we're bearing witness in God's presence against ourselves, telling the truth that we're phony in this area, we're phony in the other. And I want to tell you something tremendously restful. Instead of trying to climb a ladder, starting admitting what we really are. And I want to tell you the Lord is, is very interesting. You know, if anybody in a prayer meeting doesn't pray the usual prayer of aspiration in the first person plural, but begins to pray a prayer in the first person singular, I, and starts admitting where they are. Lord, I've had a bad day today. Lord, I've let you down at the office. Lord, I haven't been a witness today. I'm in bad shape today. If someone prayed like that, what would happen? Do you know what would happen to you? You'd be praying here 
You'd hear that prayer, and you... <laughs> and you wouldn't be the only one. That sort of man would get the interest of people. It would certainly get heaven's interest. If you want to catch God's ear, start taking off the mask. I'm not necessarily talking about open public confession, but in actual fact between you and God. It sometimes involves honesty with our fellows too, but basically with the Lord. And God will be able to say to you whatever else he is, he's a saviour, yes, he, everything he says about himself is completely true, but I'll say this about him, he's not hiding it. And that man is now a candidate for that vision of the cross this is going to make all things new. He is going to see in the hour of his honesty. Heaven open for him. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon that dear son of man. Echoes the mercy whispers of love to that man. And he's going to find that he who felt himself so far off isn't far off at all. By the mighty power of the blood of Jesus, he's been brought into the home of God's presence. And he's got there. And this is a step that is often reiterated. It's only until the next time when something goes wrong. And when something goes wrong, you know what to do. Before you didn't. The best you knew before was a frantic climbing which got you nowhere. But you know, there's a ladder. There's a ladder custom made for me. I know things have gone wrong. And you needn't be down and defeated for any longer then it takes you to get to the foot of that ladder again. Only to find Jesus there. The one who forgave, still ready to forgive. The one who cleansed, still ready to cleanse. And that power of the blood bringing you once again into the holy. And it could be, but it could be that some of us, the best we know in our Christian life has been pathetic climbing and trying to adhere to rules and formulas. We've all done it. No one has done it more than I. And you know, I can very easily slip back to the old way. And the Lord had to convict me, Roy, you're striving again. You're not coming to the cross. Struggling instead of repenting. But oh, I praise God. He brings me back to that old rugged cross. In your hymn books, we haven't got them here, of course. It doesn't matter. We have the hymn beneath the cross of Jesus. In most American books, you only have three verses. We have five. And the two omitted verses are probably some of the best. Here's one of them. Oh, safe and happy shelter. Speaking of the cross. Oh, safe and happy shelter. Oh, refuge, tried and sweet. Oh, trysting place. Where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. As to the holy patriarch. The wondrous dream of sin. So seems my Saviour's cross to me. A ladder up to heaven. The lies beneath its shadow. But on the farther side, the darkness of an awful grave. The gate so steep and wide. But there between us stands the cross. Two arms outstretched to save like a watchman. Set to guard the way. To that eternal grave. But you know these old hymn writers, they've got it. Do you know, I believe what's needed is for the preachers to come up to the, in their preaching, to come up to the words of the song. The message of grace and mercy is in our hymns that has been lost so often in our pulpit. And there it is. As to the holy patriarch, the one whose dream was given, so seems my Saviour's cross to me, a ladder up to heaven. And that little note on our bedroom door said, even if your pillow be like snow, dear one, and you're as down as you've ever known, there is a ladder leading up from it to heaven. And the angels of God are ascending and descending on it. And that ladder whose foot is on the earth and the top in heaven is Jesus. And the foot of that ladder is as available to you as it possibly can. Just be in the family. Just start taking off the mask. Just can start confessing your need. And you're at the foot of the cross. And if you're really at the foot of the cross, you've got to. 
into victory, into peace. Such is the mighty power of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Now let's sing uh, a hymn because uh, Pam, you ready Pam, are you to add a word? Number 50. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded home. Can anybody tell me what verse this hymn is based on? Can you tell me the book of the Bible where it comes from to begin with? There is a balm in Gilead. Oh, it's no good singing. Uh, these things, you might, you might think it's just a hymn writer making it up. Well, I don't blame you. It's not a very well-known one, but a beautiful one. Listen. At the end of Jeremiah 8, is there no barb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Is there no balm in Gilead? That was where the balsam trees grew in Gilead. They were there in abundance. Is there no physician there? Of course there are. There were more doctors in Gilead than anywhere else. Then why in the world? Is the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? I don't know. It's not for lack of balm. And it's not for lack of physician. The blood of Jesus has never lost its power. Is there no balm in Gilead, no power in precious blood? Of course there is. Is there no physician? Of course. Then the question is, why then? Is not the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? Well, it can only be we're not calling sin, sin. Or we're not daring to believe. There's something better than many struggling up a ladder. Yes, there is balm in Gilead, as this hymn says. All right, now, you've sat for a bit, quite a bit while I've been talking. Just stand and sing a verse or two of this great one. There is a balm. down, that's not what exactly what you call a great success. <laughs> I, I was as much to blame as you. I hadn't really checked up on what version of the music we had. Our pianist did the best, he didn't know where it was going, and you didn't either. But never mind, hallelujah, there is a bar in Gilead. There is power in the precious blood of Jesus. Now let me rig my wife up for a moment. Praise the Lord that there is balm in Gilead. I wonder whether, as you've been listening to Roy, you began to feel well, there is a balm in Gilead. Did you? 
I was thinking as I was listening to him that the message of grace really only comes to us with power when we've been trying to climb these ladders and we've just got discouraged and we felt that we really couldn't make it and then the message of grace comes and you feel my there's something else this is something else there's uh, some verses in Job don't worry to um, turn to it it's Job 14 and it says they cope of a tree as it be cut down that it will sprout again and that the tender branch thereof will not cease though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant and I feel really that the message of grace is like the scent of water you begin to hear something different and it's the Lord saying if your pillar has seen like a stone there is a ladder. There is balm in Gilead. There is power in the blood. And you know, sometimes as we're going around, people say, well, what really are you doing? What, what sort of message are you bringing? Is a message of, of revival, of repentance, of um, renewal, of the blood of Jesus and we really like to say well really we feel that the Lord is helping us to share the message of grace as we are finding it and I think it is a very misunderstood word theologically in our churches today people say oh grace keep grace go on living as you like go on coming back asking the Lord to forgive you but you just go on Really, grace, if we truly understand it, is much more demanding than law. You know, we can be very good church-going people. We can go Sunday morning, evening, Sunday school, Wednesday prayer meeting, be involved in all sorts of things. But if really the Lord started to shine his light into our home into our relationships with one another into our work that's something different and the Lord is not content with these things as I gave my testimony last night and we can be doing things but not really walking with Jesus. And I just praise the Lord for this grace and what it's meant to me. I can't tell you what it means to know that I can come to the Lord as I am, that I don't have to climb this ladder. You know, we're all, I believe, in our churches, even the best of our churches, climbing ladders and we're not real you know we, it, it comes across somehow it comes through books it comes very often through preaching it comes sort of down through tradition somehow that we've got to climb a ladder and so we look at each other and we feel that so and so well they're up a bit further than we are and uh, so we can't be real because we we don't want other people to see that we are not climbing the ladder. And um, I just feel it's terribly important that we get hold of this. And I praise the Lord as I'm thinking of the old Jacob. How different he was from Nathaniel. Jesus said of Nathaniel, 
and is the life indeed in whom there is no guile. But Jacob was an Israelite indeed in who was full of guile. I mean that's the whole picture of Jacob, isn't it? I mean you know the story so well, better than I do probably. And how his name was supplanter, deceiver, and how he was always engineering everything in order to get things to turn out his way. And yet God broke into his life just when things seemed to be really so terribly difficult for him and he had messed everything up and there he was and yet God came and God spoke to him words of incredible good what grace that God came to Jacob at that time Roy and I read uh, together just as the Lord seems to lead us from book to book and as much as we feel he guides us to read day by day and uh, a time ago we were very much in the Old Testament and I think probably we started uh, in Exodus and we saw there with Moses do you remember how Moses said to the Lord I beseech thee show me thy glory do you remember that bit and how the Lord put him in the cliff in the rock and he passed by and he proclaimed the name of the Lord and do you know how it said the Lord, he proclaimed the name of the Lord, merciful and gracious. I don't want to read all this, it's going to take too long. And uh, we started off thinking about that, the Lord, merciful and gracious. And then as we were reading in the Old Testament, we saw that phrase of the Lord repeated again and again. Wherever we were reading in Exodus, in the Psalms, in Deuteronomy, this was the name of the Lord and really the name means the character as you know and we were thrilled with that and it meant a lot to us now you've got also I don't know if you've got King James you've got different versions and I think it probably is different but in the King James that's what it is but then we were thrilled to see another pair of words and that was the poor and the needy you see, if you've got a King James, if you read the King James, just how often the poor and the needy come. And it was something that we kept on seeing. There you are, there it is again, you'd say. And it's quite interesting to see how often these two pairs of words come. But then we saw something else. We saw that again and again, the Lord, merciful and gracious, was on the side of the poor and the needy. And that is everywhere. And that was tremendously encouraging to me. I thought, well, praise the Lord, how wonderful it is that he's on the side of the poor and the needy. Not on the side of those who are trying some sort of letter those of us who think we're getting on well or feel perhaps that we ought to be getting on well but on the side of those who are willing to see that they're poor and needy poor without any means of meeting their needs spiritually Jesus says, isn't he? blessed for the poor in spirit well, that blessed me so much, I can't tell you. It, it was just a new sight of grace for me. I knew about coming to Jesus as I was, finding in him all I needed, and finding that there is power in the blood. But it encouraged me to go on. And, you know, if I felt down, I'd say, well, Lord, 
Well, I do feel down, but thank you that you're on the side of the poor and the needy. And forgive me for feeling down. I mean, this is something. You know, you, uh, not because I'm saying it, but I'd like to say you don't know what you're listening to. <laughs> it's dynamite, really. It really is. I know I'm saying this in a very soft, gentle sort of way, that sort of voice I've got. But it really is. If you can get hold of this, this is what the ladder is all about. This is Jesus. This is grace. This is the scent of water. This is the balm in Gilead that makes the wounded whole. You know, this is not talking about people who are outside of Christ. This is talking about us, Christians, who've been finding it such hard going, who feel we can't really make it. Well now, if you feel that that's not true, all I can say is that you haven't tried hard enough. You try hard enough to make the Christian life work, and you'll soon find you can't make it work. If you're real. Well, this is balm, as I say to me. I rejoice in it. Now, Roy and I have been married only since 1968. His first wife, Revel, you will see on those books, it says Roy and Revel Hessian. I don't know any of you've noticed that. She was my dear and great friend. And she meant so much to me. And she was killed in a car crash in 1967. And that was a tremendous thing for all of us in England. We loved her so much. The Lord had used her so much amongst us. She was so anointed of the Lord. I'd never heard a woman speak with such anointing as ever. And when the Lord took her, we felt what a tremendous thing it was, what a loss it was. And yet we prayed for her because we knew she was with him. But, uh, you know, Roy and Revel were so close, I can remember when a friend of mine called me on the telephone and gave me the news of this accident. They said, you know, we have to tell you that the Lord's taken Revel. And I said, how's Roy? And they said, we don't know. He's been injured, but we don't know how badly. And I can remember my words at that time. And I said, it would be a mercy if the Lord took him too. I don't know what he'll do without Revel. And that was true. Because they were so close, and the Lord used them so much as the team together. But the Lord healed Roy and brought him back to us. And then in about a year, um, not as long as that, we were brought together in a most wonderful way. Well now this is a very big thing for me, because as I said, Devil was very gifted, and she was very much loved at home and over here. And you know, I thought, well, how am I going to follow her, much as I loved her? How do I follow her? And then one day, Roy said to me, he said, you know, and this was right early on, either before, just before we married or just after, he said, you know, I asked Revel one day if she could sum up in a few words what she felt the Lord had done for us, what the Lord had shown us since the days when he met us in revival years ago. And she told me that she thought for a bit and she said, Well, I feel that I've seen a new sight of the character of God whereby I can afford to be real. Got it? I've seen a new sight of the character of God whereby I can afford to be real. Now that meant so much to me. I just praised the Lord, and I thought, praise the Lord. I've seen a new sight of the character of God, too. 
I've seen his mercy and grace and I can afford to be poor and needy. And it just set me free in a new way. I felt, well, much as I loved her, I didn't have to try to be like her and climb some sort of ladder that I could never have climbed. So I could afford just to be real and to be me. And I praise God for that. It meant so much to me. But you know, it's so easy to know these things and yet not to put them into practice. And, you know, you catch yourself out, climbing ladders, even if you go around like this. And there was a time in South Africa we were um, on a tour like this. And, you know, I'd been sharing this very thing that had blessed my heart so much. And then one day we were staying in a guest house, missing a guest house where we enjoyed the fellowship with a lot of people who you know, uh, in fellowship and just enjoying things of the Lord together. And uh, one day, I had made up my mind that I was going down to the shop. And we were talking at breakfast time with some people. And uh, I said to Roy, well, I'd just go off and go down to the shop to get my coat. So I left the room and I, I left him talking with these people. And uh, I went upstairs to get my coat to go off down to the shop. And then before I left, he came up. And uh, he said, oh, you know those people we were talking with? They've asked me to go and pray with them. One of the ladies there hasn't been well. And uh, they asked me to go and have a special time of prayer. So I said, oh, that's fine. Did they ask me to come? And uh, he said, well, no, as a matter of fact, they didn't. And uh, so I said, oh, that's all right. And he said, well, of course, they don't think you're as spiritual as I am. <laughs> Which, of course, is true. <laughs> he was just on my shaking. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, we laughed about it, you know, how these things happen didn't think any more about it. And I said, okay, you go and pray. I'll go down to the shop. But, <laughs> do you know, as I walked down to the shop, the devil came to me, and he's the accuser for breaking, and he said, well, there you are, you see. Told you so. You hadn't made it after all these years. If they thought you were someone, you know, a woman of prayer, they would have said, this ought to be your wife, wouldn't you? You see, you really haven't made it. And he showed me how I hadn't climbed that ladder. I hadn't got there. And you know, I listened to him. And I got so in the dark. And I really felt so sort of despondent. And I felt really, you know, after all this time, I still hadn't made it as a Christian. And I really did get in the dark. But if the, the devil is the accuser, the Holy Spirit is the encourager of the burden. And you know, he came along and he said to me on the other side, he said, but Pam, what have you been saying? What have you been saying to people about the Lord, the merciful and gracious being on the side of the poor and needy? And if they don't think you're anything much, aren't you poor and needy? <laughs> and if you haven't come to some spiritual heart, aren't you poor and needy? And I said, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for showing me again. Thank you for being on my side when I'm like that. And I just came back like that missionary I told you about yesterday. As I was walking, and I said, Lord, forgive me for guessing and forgive me for all the things that make me poor and needy. And I found that there was power in the blood and there was balm in the air. And the darkness went and the sun came out and I was praising the Lord. And I went back to Roy and I said, Roy, this is a wonderful thing. 
And if people can really see that the, the devil cannot hit them down too far, that Jesus is there because he's on the side of the poor and the needy and there's time of life, you can't but win every time. And that's true. You can't but win if you walk this way. Now, isn't that the center of all things? Isn't that balm? Isn't that something to rejoice about? You know, when we hear about revival, we think that we're in for a sort of traumatic time of weeping and <laughs> all that kind of thing. But revival is really the saints rejoicing again. You know when the angels announced that Jesus was born Behold, bring the tidings of great joy. Their tidings of great joy. But you wouldn't think it really, would you? When we're all climbing ladders and not able to go get there. We get so sort of well, you know, you wouldn't think it was their tidings of great joy. But when we see there's power in the blood, when we see there's farm in Gilead, when we see that this Lord most embraces is always on the side of the poor and needy. But there is a matter. We will go. Let's sing there is a bomb in Gilead. Yes, the chorus. I think we're all right on that.
And frankly, as pastor, I don't know. I know he's already said a lot to my heart this week. And although we're not going to worry about too many steps, I think he is taking us a step at a time. And this is now the end of the third service. And I think after the next four services, we'll have a pretty good idea of what God has tried to say to us. And then Sunday morning, uh, and maybe tomorrow night and the next night, Thursday night or Friday night, we'll have a time of sharing. And, and any time you want to praise the Lord uh, in a word of testimony, you're welcome to do that. You're welcome to do it now if you just really have to, and, and we'll be glad for you to do that. But uh, however the Lord works this week, and I and several of you have prayed that we're not going to try to put the Lord in the mold. Uh, you know, we don't know how he's going to work, and uh, he's sovereign, and we're going to allow him to be that this week. Um, he's even sovereign through my mistakes that I made Sunday morning. I gave the people uh, an order of service and uh, totally missed part of it. And yet by Sunday evening, I was rejoicing in the Lord in spite of that because of the blood of Jesus. And that's what Pam said. Jim, that's under the blood. So everything that happens is under the blood. Good or bad, it's under the blood. Mm-hmm. And we need to turn our eyes upon Jesus. But Sunday morning, we want to have a time of sharing and a time of praising. And we may have some of that this week and we may not, but we'll just trust the Lord to leave. But I do know that God is working in my heart and I'm looking forward to, if not before then, sharing many of the things that he shared with me. Um, and then I know he's working in many of your hearts. And so we probably won't have any preaching Sunday morning. Uh, so that we can just share with each other what God has done during this week. Let's bow here today. Father, I continue to be amazed at your mercy and your grace and how you continue to focus our eyes upon yourself. Father, I'm inclined to look at people I'm inclined to look at myself. I'm inclined to look at a week like this and say, I know what you're going to do, even when I say that I don't. Father, I praise you for the precious word that was shared tonight through Roy and his hands. I thank you that you have caused my eyes today, once again, a friend and a new to be turned upon you. I praise you from the depths of my heart, Lord, that I uh, have ceased at least today, to struggle and strive and please anybody except you. I thank you that it's such a delight, and I find it very easy to put all of my sins, my entire life, under the blood of Christ. And I rejoice tonight in the word that I've heard and the encouragement that I've had today through these dear people. And I thank you for what you're doing in the hearts and the lives of our people. Sometimes it's not obvious, and yet it doesn't have to be. Because, as Brother Roy says, revival in its truest expression is just the life of Jesus. And Father, we come to you just wanting his life to be lived through us. And we don't know how that's going to take place except through the message of brokenness and repentance and turning our eyes upon you. But I thank you as a pastor for the word that pricked my heart tonight. And I saw a new vision of grace and mercy. And although what Pam said is true, that under grace there are more demands than law, I recognize all of those demands were made in the person of Christ and kept in him, not by me. So I thank you for this body of believers, and we commit this entire week to you and pray that you would bring each night those people that you want. Cause us to be faithful, because we know, Father, unless we're hungry, and thirsty and poor and needy, then we'll, we'll feel that we don't need it and we're sufficient. But we come, Father, tomorrow night. We look forward to it. We anticipate the service tomorrow night to sit at your feet as you share through your own hands. Bless each one of us as we go our way. And may we just remember that every sin that we commit tonight and tomorrow immediately should be placed under the blood so that we can experience your mercy and your grace. We pray in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen.